welcome back. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker uh, for this session, uh, Associate Professor Carol Hines. Um, she's going to talk about poetry in Japanese fortune telling and temple counseling practice. Over to you, Carol. Thanks, Wayan. So um, I wanted to talk to you today about this fortune telling practice and how poetry is used in this. So I'm a literature and cultural studies scholar, um, particularly interested in poetry. And I've discovered recently that there's quite a lot of fortune telling that uses poetry to um, explain the fortune to the pundits, if you like. So, and of course that doesn't move. There we go. So before I start that, I'm not quite sure whether any of you or all of you know what the word omikuji means in Japanese or is in Japanese. So the o is an honorific um, and the mi is referring to the gods and then the kuji bit is referring to, I mean, it can mean literally sacred lot, but it's also used for lotteries generally now. So there's an interesting spectrum with these fortunes that spreads from a sort of fortune cookie style of fun through to a sort of deeply held belief that um, it's actually explaining to you how you can understand um, forks in your life. So traditionally, this Mikuji fortune telling was very closely linked to ascertaining the will of a particular god. Um, and so I think we need to keep in mind that this is not just the fortune cookie bit that I'm talking about, but I'm talking about the deeply held belief that this is, it's a bit like Nara was just talking about, the individual is quite responsible for understanding their fortune and working with the monks involved to understand how they should view their life. So basically this little container you can see there is a wooden container with lots of sticks in it and you shake it and as you shake it you're supposed to say shaka 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 and as one of the um, sticks falls out it'll have a number on it and as you can see those little drawers on the right hand side there um, the monk or the um, shrine attendant would draw the um, slip of paper for you and then you would be able to draw your fortune and it's usually traditionally numbered from one to a hundred. So these are just two examples of what they might look like. At the top it tells you whether it's a good fortune or a really good fortune. Um, many of them have, as this one on the right, um, Chinese uh, expressions that are then explained in Japanese to the right. Um, and then this Chinese is explicated in the middle and then at the bottom it's sort of giving you some indication of what the fortune might mean. Now on the fun side of the spectrum there's a lot of now vending machines that you can buy your fortune through. So you put 100 yen in and you get even in English your fortune or you can buy um, various different fortunes. So as I said it moves from this spectrum of fun through to much more deeply held belief. So I wanted to share with you today two case studies that are coming from the Enyakuji Temple Complex, which is on the slopes of Mount um, Hie, on Biwa Lake, so very close to the Kyoto Nara region. Um, and it's a very famous temple complex. Um, many famous monks were from this region. And before I share the poems with you, I need to talk to you about Ryogen. So he was the chief abbot of Enyakuji in the 10th century and was, um, is famed for his sort of rejuvenation of the Tendai school of Mahayana Buddhism and is thought to be one of the precursors of the warrior fighting monks. But he's known by a number of different names. One is Ganzan Daishi and Suno Daishi, the horned great master and Mame Daishi, the um, bean great master. I'll talk about Ganzan Daishi again in a minute. So the temple to Ganzan Daishi um, which is, as I said, another name of Ryogen, is known to be the birthplace of Omikuji. And as you enter into this temple through the big gate on the right hand side, the sign there says, this is a hall of Amanda, do Amanda or a dojo for meditative and Omikuji practice. So it's both for prayer and for prayerful Omikuji practice. So for those visiting in prayer or with a request, please enter quietly. Now, Ganzan Daishi, Ryogen in his Ganden, Ganzan Daishi form, as I said, is um, a supposed to traditionally, mythically, to have invented Omikuji practice. 
And, but it does appear that this is not necessarily the case, but during the Edo period, Tenkai Sozu, who's another very famous monk, um, wrote that it was Ganzan Daishi who invented um, Omikuji. And he was thought to be, so Ryogen and Ganzan Daishi was thought to be the incarnation of this particular kanon who in the Heian period, so 10th century, was held to represent good luck. So whether or not he invented it, there is this counseling manual, fortune telling counseling manual that a lot of temples use. So when someone's chosen their fortune and they go to the monk to get some assistance in interpreting that fortune, you can, uh, the monks refer to this manual. Um, so it was heavily used in the Edo period um, as a form of counseling. So as I said a minute ago, Ganzan Daishi is also known as Tsuno Daishi, which means the horned great master. And this image of him as a sort of emaciated skeletal figure with these huge big horns is said to be something that when he was praying for a particular plague that was, well, not for the plague, but to ward off the plague that had um, attacked the Kyoto region, he looked in the mirror and saw himself as this horned um, daishi. And so this image is, is sold at New Year. It's a talisman that is used to ward off evil. And it was very popular in the Edo period as something that you um, placed near your entranceway to protect your house, to drive away evil spirits. So this um, Edo poem at the bottom there, the horned master, a hidden face on the entrance gate pine, is showing something of the guardian strength with which this horned master was known. So if I talk about the range of blessings that um, you can get on a um, Omokuji fortune telling slip, it can re, um, range from really good fortune, middle fortune, small fortune, just fortune, through to bad luck and very, very bad luck. And increasingly, temples are not using the bad luck ones. And so when you, pay 100 yen to get your vending machine fortune, it's very unlikely that you'll get a cure or a die cure fortune. Um, so why am I interested in this? I was, I've done some work recently on um, the tanka used on pilgrimages in Japan. And this, exam, this photograph is an example of one that is just randomly hung up on a tree as you're on the Shikoku Henro pilgrimage. Carol, is there any problem? I can't hear. have a, a problem. Hmm. Uh, how should we contact Carol? Hmm. Okay. So she uh, Carol. She, she's trying to log in, I suppose. Um, Carol is. Uh, uh, gone so she might be rejoining Hope, hopefully um okay there's an issue here um do you have her mobile phone nara no um, no, um so uh i'll uh Send her a message. Oh yeah, she might not. So. Mm. Okay, she's completely out. Um, um, we had a similar problem earlier, uh, you know, last time. I mean, um, okay, uh, somebody else is joining, but not Carol. Uh, let's see. Perhaps we we send her an email, perhaps.
first technical problem. Let's see. Um, I just sent her an email. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I'm sorry that we are having a technical problem. Hmm. Try to uh, if it move her. So we have to be patient a bit, a bit. Hopefully, she is joining soon. Uh, I try to phone the. Oh, here you are. Hi, Carol. So we lost you a moment ago. You are un please unmute. Okay. They're trying to connect my new office to the internet and they just managed to do it right then and disconnect everything. So, okay. um, hang on, I'll have to share again when I, can I, shall I just keep going? Sorry. Yep, please. No. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay. So. Just as a bit of context, there are the tr these traditional poems, the Tanka poems of 57577, you're probably familiar with haiku poems that are 575, have historically been used um, to divine oracles in both Shinto and Buddhist traditions. So there's always been this very deep link between um, omens of the gods, if you like, and it used as fortune telling. So I wanted to show you just hopefully two short case studies of how poetry is used in some of this Onikuji practice. So one of the smaller temples in the Enrakuji complex, which is called Zenkoji, um, I had the opportunity last year to interview the re now retired head monk. Um, so he'd been the chief abbot of this particular temple and they discovered a woodblock print that is this that was used in the Edo period to print out the Omikuji slips. It's very, it's been used so much you can barely see the carving on it anymore, but they would have put a big sheet of paper on this and then um, cut it up into the different Omikuji. And so at this temple, instead of the hundred slips, they have 64 slips ranging from optimum fortune, good fortune, partial good fortune, and then bad luck or bad fortune. And this is what they look like once they're, um, I mean, these, this is a printed version that was a Meiji contemporary version made from the original um, Edo period version. So number one, it says there's no poem necessary. So we don't need to explicate this to you because if you've got great fortune, you've got great fortune. And actually often getting great fortune is regarded as unlucky because if, if this is the top that you're going to go from here on, it's down all the way. And so you don't actually want to get um, the top good fortune one. So if you look at number two, unexpectedly you've drawn the greatest treasure. So each one of these has a, the, um, below the number, there's a little box that shows you one little phrase and then there's the poem. So unexpectedly you've drawn the greatest treasure every heart's desire fulfilled the blessings of all the gods and spirits be upon you so you can see that one's pretty strong on the positive or like a parent first meeting their child so describing that delight still greater delight that it brings joy and still greater joy so perhaps if you were hoping to have a child or if you were um, looking to fall in love even. This could be a good fortune that is telling you that there's so much joy in store for you any moment. Um, like the first meeting, the one you dream of, our hearts as one sharing love's secret whispers, such delight. So if you want to fall in love and you need advice on how it is that you're gonna meet someone, you're drawing this fortune and being told that actually love is gonna go in a very positive direction. And the last one, like a bird greeting the spring, 
Sprouting blades bring the spring, this gentle evening so thick with grasses. Now there's a lot of the fortunes in this 64 that are very closely tied to images of nature um, and the turning of the seasons and how that turning of the seasons reflects your emotion. And I wanted to show you a couple of bad fortunes, um, which are, I think perhaps a bit more obscure and hard to interpret. And when I spoke to the abbot about um, why was poetry used in these omikuji, and I, I thought he would say, you know, that poetry is metaphorical expression and that it's much easier for us to express human emotion if we use poetic um, language. And what he actually said was very prosaic was that in the Edo period, fewer and fewer people were going to the temples anymore and that the monks wanted a way of getting people to come to back to the temples and they thought, we'll put these obscure poems in, they won't understand them and they'll have to make an appointment with the monk to have a discussion about what it actually means, whether that is true. Um, or is the only reason I think is something different. But if you look at 52 and 53, so they're both bad fortune, mist of beauty unparalleled lingers at the peak, only the name of this mountain is great. Or like a dog unable to bark, though ever calling, the song of the bird is not heard, regrettably just a name. So both of these, these poems I think are referring to the fact that um, names and status is very important in Japan. And so this is reprimanding people who are placing too much credence on their name or their image and are not thinking about their inner being. And that like the mist that is something you can't hold in your hand, it will just dissipate. And so you need to think beyond your name. You need to be more than a bird who's constantly calling, but no one can hear you because it's just your name you're saying. Um, 54, like striking a spark against a frozen pine. Taking the chance, unsure of success, my heart is harrowed. Now this is one that the abbot explained to me as um, you might be falling in love with someone, you might think that they love you, but their heart is like a frozen pine and you're desperately trying to strike a spark against their frozen heart but actually it's your own heart that suffers. So you're confronted by this terrible suffering. Um, or um, it might be something to do with company success. You want to make a lot of money and then you've taken a chance, not sure whether you're gonna be successful, but actually you're gonna meet with misfortune. So it's suggesting that you pause for a moment and rethink. So, sorry, how much longer do I have? Cause I've stuffed up the thing. You have, uh, let's say, three more minutes to go, or even a bit more, because so, we lost a couple of minutes. <laughs> sorry. So the other case study that I wanted to show you is also at this same Hiazan temple, at Mount Hia temple. But it's talking about, so this is a contemporary practice where, again, you're admonished as you enter the temple. This is a different temple in the complex that if you're not taking this seriously, if you just want to try your luck, please don't come here. This is when you have, um, you've, you're standing at a crossroads and you want to think about which way you should go in life. And so they give you a list of the type of things you can pray for. You can paint them onto a candle that is burnt or put them onto a bamboo strip. And here's an example of um, so here's the monk praying for these two men who came with a joint request to say that they wanted to have their fortune read, that they were trying to decide whether they should go into business together or whether in fact um, they should go on different paths. And this, this is an example of the fortunes that they were given in the middle. Now you can see from the pictures that they're Edo period pictures. And here, um, the elder of the two men got 21, which was good fortune, saying that winter's cold has passed and spring is here. And in your heart, it's time to let go of the bad and turn to the good. If you do not, great evil will follow. So here again, they explain their worries to the, to the monk. They tell him that they're trying to decide about whether they should go into business together. And this first fortune, you can see the sun is starting to shine through the clouds. He's, he's 
in a new space, he should let the sun shine on him and she, he should take on new challenges. Whereas the lower picture, um, can you see there's an underling bowing to a samurai? So this young man had been given the sack from his company because he'd been rude to one. He'd refused to use appropriate honorific language and he'd been rude to his boss and had been given the sack, but he had a child to support and a wife to support. And he was trying to decide whether he should go into business with this other guy. And so his fortune was now is an important time. The way you think makes the good seem bad and the bad seem good. Do not let your guard down. So here he's being given advice that he's responsible for what he's done so far and he needs to re review what he's thinking is good and what he's thinking is bad, as bad. And if he doesn't do that, then he won't be able to um, find a positive way forward. So. I suppose in conclusion, I just wanted to show that these were not fortune cookie types of fortune telling, but that it's a deeply embedded cultural practice of well-being and that the monks were very closely involved in this counselling support. Um, and often when I talk about psychology in Japan, people have said that it's, you know, we need to use Western psychology because there isn't a tradition of psychological counselling in Japan. But it seems through this omikuji practice, there is a deeply embedded form of um, self-discovery, if you like, um, self-searching and self-well-being. And I find it very interesting that poetry is being used in this space. And I just wanted to share one last thing with you. The, um, in terms of COVID, there's quite a lot of practice now where this horned um, daishi is being used as a telling people to put this image up on their walls, put this image up on your house, and that will help protect us from COVID. Thank you. I'm sorry I dropped out. Okay, thank you, Carol. Okay, so now uh, Q&A session. So do you have any questions? Um, you can type in the chat box or just raise your questions. No? I mean, just, okay, uh, Nara? Uh, just uh, uh, on your last point, uh, uh, Carol, um, you know, uh, the idea that in Japan there was no kind of, uh, you know, separate psychology thing. Mm -hmm. um, is um, it uh, uh, you know is uh, in general in East Asia I guess uh, all those uh, influenced by Buddhism yeah uh, is it, a part of their daily thinking but it's not separated because they think the connection to everything uh, yeah. you know uh, and uh, so in uh, Western understanding everything is uh, sort of separated and uh, compartmentalized yeah science yeah. and philosophy and everything. So, um, not necessarily the traditional philosophy, actually, uh, even in Western traditional philosophy, it, it is uh, a lot of emphasis on the connection to other uh, beings. Uh, so, um, so, for instance, in, uh, in my case, when I was looking at this thing, uh, uh, there were, you know, it, traditionally, there was no psychology as such, but recently they started to, um, uh, uh, started to uh, sort of model, uh, especially in the uh, medicine field. Uh, so they started to model uh, after the Western thing. Mm -hmm. So even though there was no uh, no psychology as such, but now they actually uh, created kind of psy mm -hmm. psychology or, or, or psychological section promote health or something. Yeah, but yeah. The, the the reality is, you know because their basic philosophy is the looking at everything holistically yeah they still do you know the, the traditional way even though the name is uh, um, is uh, is psychology or psychological treatment so uh, yes I, I think really interesting that this was if you are at a crossroads in your life and if you're unsure how to go let us help you um, pray with you draw a fortune and then we will use that fortune to discuss with you um, what paths you should take. Mm -hmm. And the monk spent at least an hour talking to these young men about 
possible pathways in this life. And it wasn't, you know, donate this much money to the temple or, you know, come back and attend this many services. It was very much a self-help session around um, Tsuno Daishi or Ganzan Daishi will walk with you. He will walk with you as you make this decision. I will help you, but these poems are going to help you understand mm -hmm. where your life is at the moment. So that metaphorical language mm -hmm. used to help you think about and be self-responsible, I thought was really interesting. Yes, so uh, I just wanted to underline what your point Yeah, no, I agree with you, yeah. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, Carol, uh, it's interesting to see that, you know, you have this uh, ancient cultural practice uh, still, you know, uh, ongoing. And, and also uh, to see that you have a shift between, you know, serious cultural practice and also something for fun. Mm. Is there any research uh, investigating uh, the proportion of this kind of, you know, practices on one thing? Uh, that's one thing. Another thing is, you know, even though those people who seriously go uh, for this uh, session, do they really believe in, in the content of the, uh, you know, the fortune that's going to happen to, to them? So I don't know the answer to that, Wayan. Um, yes, well, I haven't found much research into this space. I have found one scholar who started to look at um, the oracle style of poetry and from, from the very, I mean, like one of the first poems in the Kojiki, one of our oldest recorded texts is an oracle fortune-telling poem. Um, but I, I haven't had the, I mean, I was hoping to be in Japan right now and be exploring this, but unfortunately that is not happening. Um, I, I do think if these two young men are anything to go by, they did genuinely believe in this. I don't think they were, like, I think if you'd asked them, are you a practicing Buddhist? They probably would have said no. But one of them's mother knew this, knew this monk and introduced him to the monk and the mother knew he was worried about his life and he suggest, she suggested he go and see him and then he invited them to come up to the temple to formally do this. So it was, it was a formal ritual to help them in something they knew they were worried about. So it wasn't just let's meet and have a chat. It's come to the temple, let's go through this formal ritual and then we will be able to help you. Um, okay. But I mean, I agree, lots of people, it's, it's more of a fun um, thing, mm -hmm. I guess. Yes, when I was, you know, in Japan, you know, I think something to try, you know, as a non-Japanese visiting Japan. Yeah, no, I mean, everyone's encouraged to do it. At New Year, you should get a fortune and, you know, then you tie it to a tree and you clap and you say, yeah, my life's going to be great. So, so the fortune cookie element of it, I think, is very strong. Good. We have a couple of more minutes uh, still. Uh, is there any last In minute? In the um, chat, I've got a question about Japanese people being well known for being okay. non-religious, um, which I find is a really interest so i agree in some ways but one of the things we've we talk about when we're teaching japanese language is there's so much deeply embedded cultural practice that is born of religion in japan either shinto or buddhist a lot of people have buddhist shrines in their house that they have their ancestors um, plaques to their ancestors who've passed away. A lot of people pray to those um, past ancestors regularly. Um, if ever, at every meal you would put a bit of rice and a, some hot tea um, at the family altar. And does that mean that they are not religious? I don't think it's religion in the same way, but I think religious practice is deeply embedded into Japanese society. And so it's too simplistic to say that Japanese are not religious, I think. Um, and I think Buddhism is incredibly open-minded about non-Buddhists participating in all of their rituals, um, much less, more so than Christianity is. Um, so I think they would welcome anyone to participate in this practice. 
it's a bit esoteric and it's a bit hard to understand. Um, so I think you'd need a very good interpreter if you were a foreigner trying to understand this and, and get them to help. I mean, I would not feel comfortable, I think, having someone help me on my fortune in this way. Good. Um... I think if there's no uh, other questions, I, I just wanted to add to what Carol said. Uh, you, you know, the Japanese are not religious. It's very uh, kind of Western way of thinking uh, on, on religion, of religion. You know, if you look at the statistics, Jap Japanese, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, 80% or 90% or 80% Buddhist and 80% uh, Shintoist and 70% Buddhist and uh, some other percentage of Christians. So more, it is up nearly 200%. Yeah. So they don't have the, the, the Christian idea of very strict, you know, believing in one God. So they believe in many, many gods, if you like. So it's uh, very kind of uh, very open-minded in that sense. So there is, uh, you know, very common phrase is saying, or oh, Japanese are born as a, a Shinto and marriage, uh, mar marrying as a, uh, as a Christian and dying as Buddhist, so. Yeah. So, so a lot of people you would say, are you religious? And they would say no, but you say, do you have a, a um, family shrine? And they would say, yes. Do you go to your family shrine regularly for Obon in August? And they would say, yes. Um, you know, are you planning to have a Buddhist funeral? Yes. So. Okay. All right. Um, there is a comment, I think. Do you want to comment on that, uh, Carol? On the... Well. It's... Yeah, Yuri, you're right. I think it is very interesting what, how we would define religion in today's Japan. And I think we've got to keep it very close to cultural practice if you like so okay. um i think we have to stop there okay because we are running out, out of time and and thank you Carol, for about the internet. nice talk and stimulating discussion and kind of interesting uh, topic okay so let's thank carol again for the interesting talk we move on to the next um session